So we've been in this uh, Christmas series the last two weeks, and in this series, we're really talking through kind of this big picture of Christmas. And last week, we kicked that off, and we're going to continue that today. And uh, for me, one of the things that always reminds me of Christmas is a life-changing experience that I had. Have anybody ever had a life-changing experience? It's one of those moments that's like seared into your mind and into your heart. I had one of those moments in 2012 when I got to go to Israel. I'm in Israel, and I, I'll never forget the day we went to Bethlehem. You know, super excited. We're going to Bethlehem, and I'm in Bethlehem, and I still remember that day when we left the Church of the Nativity where they believed Jesus was born, and then we went out into this field, and the field moment was so much more touching to me even than the Church of the Nativity because we go out into this field, and I'll show you guys a couple pictures. This is where we went, okay? This is like a cave, right? So this is a cave right just on the outskirts of Bethlehem, really right in almost in the town of Bethlehem. And we go out into this cave, and this would have been the type of cave where Jesus was born. <laughs> it wasn't like a wood stable, you know, that we all see that's all cute with the cross on it and all that. that that's not at all what it would have been like. This is more like there were these caves that were natural and that they would be used for animal shelter, and, and the shepherds would use them. And so we're out there in this field, in this moment, we're sitting in this place and we began uh, to read the different prophecies of Jesus coming and all these amazing things from scripture. And I'll show you a couple other pictures. This is kind of the inside of it. That's where they would have fires and keep themselves warm. But then go to the next one. This is the manger. Okay, it's like a, 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 a rock where they would put food to feed animals. So it wasn't a cute little wooden <laughs> manger that we love to look at. I mean, I want you guys to get the picture with me today of what really was happening. I mean, this wasn't like, you know, even a one-star hotel. This is really, really rough conditions. And of course, Jesus, Joseph and Mary are turned away, or Joseph and Mary turned away, and she has Jesus in this kind of place. And this would have been like the manger where Jesus would have been placed. And we're sitting there in this moment, and we're hearing all these prophecies about Jesus that were written hundreds and hundreds of years before he would be born. And in that moment, I was just overwhelmed sitting there realizing that God himself came, took on the flesh of man, born of a virgin, came to this earth. Now, guys, we kind of just think about that and, oh, this is a sweet story. I mean, God came born of a virgin, into this world, frail, fragile, helpless as a baby. But he came into this world the same way we came into this world, born of a woman. But Jesus obviously was very unique, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But frail, fragile, needy, helpless, vulnerable, God came to this place. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, like, it was pretty close to where I am. Because Bethlehem's not like this metropolis, okay? It's not a huge place. And it was just this moment where God was here. And it hit me, and it, like, burned into my brain that experience and how powerful it was of what God did for each one of us in that moment, that God came to this place to change history. The most important birth in all of humanity. And God chose a place like that. I mean, think about it. God came to a humble place. He didn't go to this palace or this grand place. He came to a humble place. And I believe he did that to show us that he's approachable. He's accessible. He's available to you. You know, there were no palace gates blocking the way to Jesus. There were no armies that were keeping people from coming to Jesus. There were no kings that were there. It was the ultimate king of all kings that came humbly and was born in a manger like I just showed you and was laid there. That was his first bed. The most important birth in history, the history of the world, to bring hope and freedom and purpose to your life and to my life and to bring us back into relationship with God. But here's the crazy thing. So we're in these, we're, we're at this cave, right? And, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, Jesus came here. He, he, he was born like this. And I'm overwhelmed with emotions as we're reason, reading these. But then it hits me. 
You know, the shepherds would raise their animals for sacrifice for the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not that far from Bethlehem. Like when we, we left Jerusalem earlier that day and drove to, to Bethlehem, and it's not that far away. You know, it's like, you know, here to, I don't know, South Naples. It's not that far away. And so the same animals that were raised for the sacrifices by the shepherds in those fields in that area were raised for the sins of the people for their sacrifice. That was where the sacrifices were made for the sins of the people. And this is how detailed and intentional our God is. That his son would be born in, those same pla- in that same place. The same place where the animals would be raised and they would go and they would be sacrificed. Their blood would be shed for the sins of the people. And the Old Testament would only be temporary. But the ultimate Savior, Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins would be born at this place. And it was just an overwhelming emotion in my life for all that to come together. And I'll never remember that life-changing moment. You see, the Bible teaches us in the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, Chapter 10, verse 1 through 12. I'm going to read a lot of scripture here, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So check out what the Bible says. It says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of good things to come, not the things themselves. He's referring to the sacrificial system in the Old Testament law. It was only a picture, a shadow of the real thing. The sacrifice of these animals was to reveal what would ultimately happen, and that would be the sacrifice of God's Son for our sins. It was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The Bible continues, and it says, the sacrifice under that system was repeated again and again, year after year. But they, uh, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. So the people would come to worship, they would offer their animals for sacrifice, but it was only temporary. It never ultimately cleansed them from their sin. Verse 2 says, if they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Check this out. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins. Year after year, they had to keep going back and doing it over and over. They would take the animal and they had to remember, like, I'm I'm a sinner here. And it reminded them there was no true freedom from that sin. Verse 4, for it is not possible. Check this out, guys. It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Nor is it possible for you to take away your sins. Verse 5, it says, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God the Father, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or uh, or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. Verse 8, for Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were they pleasing to you, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said in verse 9, then he said, look, I have come to do your will. Check this out. He cancels the first covenant. The first covenant is the covenant between God and his people, the sacrificial system, the law. He says, I have come to cancel This first covenant in in order to put the second into effect. The second is Jesus' grace toward me and you, his sacrifice. And then it says, verse 10, for God's will, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Christ. Don't miss this part. Once for all time. Once for all time. Verse 11, under the old covenant, that's talking about the sacrificial system and the law, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. See, it was just a picture of God and what he ultimately desired, and that was the ultimate sacrifice for my sin and your sin. Verse 12, but our high priest, this is referring to Jesus, but our high priest offered himself to God, don't miss this, as a single sacrifice for sins. Good for all time.
time. There is no repeating that needs to happen. Jesus doesn't need to die on the cross again. No animals need to be sacrificed. And then after it says that, it says, Then he sat down, talking about Jesus, he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. You see, guys, the good news is that Jesus was born so you and I could be born again. This is the same bottom line big news I had last week, and I'm going to talk about it again because this is what Christmas is all about. This is what Christmas is all about. It's not about a sweet baby in a manger and Christmas lights and Christmas trees, although I love all that stuff. And I'm not condemning it. I'm just telling you, it is about the fact that God took on the flesh of man so that you and I could overcome our greatest problem. Our greatest problem is sin. Your greatest problem isn't your finances. It isn't your family. It is sin. It is sin. It is a condition that we inherit. It is a condition that even if you want to debate me and say, well, I didn't inherit that. Well, you you, you copied it right away. You know, right after you came out of the womb, you started sinning. You know, just hang out with a a two-year-old. I mean, you know, we have a sin problem. We have a sin problem. But God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission. See, the, the sacrificial system was to amplify that we have a problem. It was to amplify our need for rescue. It was to amplify and to show us that we can't sacrifice enough to save ourselves. There's not enough good works you can do. There's not enough sacrifice you can make in your life. Like, we're not into sacrificing animals. And if you are, make sure you throw it on the grill after. We're not into that, right? We don't, nobody does that. But we do the same thing in other ways, right? In our own mind, we create, well, I'm sacrificing hard for God, so he ought to just forgive me. Well, I'm sacrificing hard for God or for my family. I'm doing this, this, this. You see, we do the same thing, but there's nothing, there's no sacrifice you can make that can correct the problem in the situation that we have is sin. You see, my sin is real. And all you said, yes, we see it. Your sin is real. God's judgment is real. But the cross is real. It's the solution to our problem, right? It takes away the sin from the sinner. And it makes us right with God. You see, And I don't have this verse for you, but Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, talks about that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, everybody's got one of two options. You either bow the knee and confess on this side of heaven, and that's that's what I, I highly encourage, or you do it and you don't get to enter into heaven. You see, every person will say Jesus is king. We just sang about Jesus the king. We just sang about him being the king of all kings. Every person will say that. Every person will proclaim that truth at some point. It's the fact. It is the word of God. But I I want to do what I'm doing to help people say it before they stand before judgment. And I'm not trying to scare you. You're like, wow, this is great. I'm glad I came to this church for the first time. And this guy's talking about hell and judgment and sin and death and all this stuff. Yeah, I am. Because I love you. Because I want you to experience life. We either do it in this life for salvation or we do it after this life for eternal separation. Everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God as he exalted high. We just sang about his return. One day we will see him face to face. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And the good news of of Christmas is that Jesus was born so that you could have life with him, so that you could be born again. Last week I did a whole message, and you can go on YouTube or you can go on our Facebook or our website and watch it. But I did this whole circle where I talked about the beginning in the garden all the way through the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament is a story of man's inability to be made right with God based on his efforts, based on the law, based on anything else. It's really a story of our need for Jesus. And that's, in essence, what Hebrews that I just read is telling us again. And we walked through the whole Old Testament, and we saw that. You see, Adam and Eve were in perfect harmony, relationship with God without sin, but they chose to disobey. And here's a biblical theological truth that you got to get a hold of. Is when they sinned and were separated from God, every one of us were born 
in the line of Adam. (laughs) Every one of us came from that family tree. And that sin, that separation from God was transferred from them to us. There's nothing we can do to fix it. And there's a lot of people that debate that, and we could get into theological debates and nuances of different things. But the reality is, even if you say, well, I don't, I don't agree with that, as I said a minute ago, just go hang out with a two-year-old this Christmas, and they'll disobey you, right? We, we've all sinned and fallen short of the standard of God. The whole Old Testament is a story of God's people choosing sin, and they, they draw near to God, and then they fall away. It's like this vicious cycle. It's man's impossibility to be made right with God. And see, because we've all been born of this, check out what Romans 5.12 says. This is really important as you understand this big idea of Christmas and the birth of Jesus. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world, check this out, through one man. So sin entered the world through Adam, through this man. And death through sin. So he sinned. Because he sinned, he's now separated from God. Because he's separated from God, death is the result of sin. The Bible says also in Romans, it says, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. So check out what the Bible says. Therefore, just as sin entered through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. Because why? All sinned. We've all sinned. But the good news is coming right after that in verse 19, Romans 5, 19. Just as through the disobedience of the one man, talking about Adam, the many were made sinners. So also the obedience of one man, talking about Jesus, the many were made righteous. The idea of being made right with God. You're standing, changing with God. Now, why am I telling you all this stuff? Well, the reason I'm telling you all this is because this is what the virgin birth is all about. Like sometimes I think at Christmas we're like, oh, so sweet. Baby born, son of God, that's awesome. But like what does all this really mean? Why does it all matter? Let's connect the dots. So I'm trying to connect some dots, and that's what I tried to do last week, and I'm trying to do again today. The virgin birth is such an essential part of understanding what took place. You see, the angel comes to Mary (laughs) And she becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit of God, not by the seed of man. And it opens up a doorway back to God. You see, every one of us were born in the line of Adam by the seed of man. Nobody in here was born outside of a man being involved. If you were born and there was a man involved in any way, which all of us were, then you inherited sin. You can't help it. It's just transferred to us. But Jesus was born in a different way. There was no man involved. God found Mary, the chosen one that he had chosen from the foundation of the world to carry and birth his son. And she became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Notice what Luke chapter 1 verse 34 through 35 says. It says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel. I mean, here this angel comes and says, you're going you're to give birth to the son of God. And she's like, how How can this be, Mary asked, since I am a virgin? This is not possible here. This is not, does not make sense. The angel answered, don't miss this. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The virgin birth changed everything. It opened the doorway of access to God through the, through the Son of Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus. This is why in John 10, I'm sorry, 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I am the gate, I am the door, I am the access point. You see, the virgin birth is so critical in understanding what God did for you because it is the truth of the doorway being opened. Because there was no sacrifice a man could make. There was no animal that he could kill. There was no good works he could do to be made right with God. So God sent his son on a rescue mission to be born of a virgin so that the doorway could be opened for us to go back. So when Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and life, no man comes to the Father except through me, that's why he makes that statement. When Christians make the statement that you, Jesus is the only way back to the Father, it's because it's the truth. 
I know that's hard for some people. But if you study the Bible, either it's true or it's not. (laughs) Right? Either it's true or it's not. And that's why it's so important with what we're doing. We're not here to have a holy huddle and have some sweet little church. We're here to change the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Because it's the only hope we have, guys. We don't need religion. We don't need a bunch of jumping through hoops. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. So, to kind of tie a bow on this whole talk, I want us to look today at a story in the ministry of Jesus in John chapter 3. Because this story is where this religious leader comes to Jesus and he's asking all these questions. Why am I here? What's all this about? And so we're going to read these verses today. I'm going to walk through them and hopefully it's going to help all this kind of connect and tie together about Jesus being born so that we could be born again. John chapter 3 verse 1, it says this, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. So if you're not new to church, ultimately what this is saying is, this guy was a religious leader, he was a person of the law, he was important, he was influential, and he came to Jesus, verse 2 says, he came to Jesus at night. Now, most everybody that is a theologian and all that clearly says he did that because he didn't want to be seen he did that so he could slip in at night and talk with Jesus because he didn't want the other religious people to see him doing this because they didn't care for Jesus because he was saying that the law is not what you need you need a personal relationship and so he came tonight and he said rabbi which is a, a, really a, a, a statement of respect that Nicodemus had toward Jesus he said we know you are a teacher who comes from God, who has come from God. Why does he know that? Next, it says, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus, even though he was a religious leader, he noticed there was something unique and different about Jesus and what Jesus was doing. Verse 3, I love what Jesus says next. Jesus doesn't say, well, thank you very much. I'm pretty awesome. He says, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. Now, here this religious leader is, and Jesus is going to go straight for the jugular. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Like, the response is kind of strange if you really think about it. Like, if you came up and you're like, well, you know, you, 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 your, your teaching is so great. Your miracles are amazing. I just want to tell you, this is awesome. You must be from God. And they didn't really respond. They, they just said, let me tell you the truth right now. No one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. So Jesus is going straight to the point with Nicodemus. Like, I know you've got all your religious hoopla, and you guys have even taken that to the extreme in, 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 with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these religious leaders. And Jesus is telling him, no one, not even you, the religious leader, can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. It goes on in verse 4, and you see the response of Nicodemus. He says, how can a man be born again when he's old? Like, this is impossible. I don't understand what you're saying, Jesus. How can I be born again? I've already been born once. How can I do this, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Like, he's really, like, his his brain is, like, spinning here. Like, are you telling me I got to go into my mother's womb again? This isn't possible. How can I be born again? Jesus answered in verse 5. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. There it is again. I'm just shooting straight with you here. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Now notice verse 6. This is important. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So what Jesus is saying is, Nicodemus, I'm not talking about going back into your mother's womb. Flesh gives birth to flesh. You've got to be born of water. It's talking about when a being born of a woman, okay? When the water breaks, you're born of water. It's natural birth. And you know that that's what he's referring to in verse 5 because of what he repeats in verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But I'm talking about a different birth. I'm not talking about a natural birth. I'm not talking about a birth that's of flesh. I'm talking about a supernatural spiritual birth. And he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Verse 7. You should not be surprised at what I'm saying. And this is Jesus talking. 
You must be born again. I mean, Jesus is just hammering home this principle, this truth that you must be born again. And then he kind of gives some insight into how this all works. Verse 8, the, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. It is the work of God, y'all. It's not the work of man. It's not the work of humans. Supernatural birth that we just celebrated through Miss Eleanor when she was baptized. That's not the work of a man. That's not because she jumped through some hoops. That not, it's not because she became religious. It's not because she decided to go to church. It's because she called on the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of her sins. And she was born again by a supernatural work of God. And you know what's so amazing is this supernatural gift of God is available to every single one of us. And that's what Jesus is telling this religious leader. I'm going to jump ahead because they keep going back and forth. But I want you to see verse 15 through 18. Because this has got, of course, John 3.16, the famous verse in it. And Jesus tells him, everyone who believes in him, talking about Jesus, may have eternal life. Verse 16. For, this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I just want to pause there for a minute because they've been having this conversation about how can I be born again? What does all this mean? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb? No, Jesus says this is a supernatural work of God. The spirit gives birth to spirit. And then we get from the supernatural to the practical of like, okay, how does this actually function? How does this take place? And that's really what verse 15 through 18 are. It's the actual practical steps of how it happens. And Jesus says, everyone who believes in, in Jesus may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, have kingdom life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus, through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe, check this out, guys, stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is what I'm talking about in Philippians chapter 2, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You see, every person has to make a personal decision. You're not going to get in on the coattails of how awesome and godly your wife is or how awesome your mom was or anything else. It's going to be based on your personal faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you may feel unqualified. You may feel like you can't be accepted by God. And I get that emotion, but that is a lie from the enemy. That is not true. Here this religious leader is, and yet Jesus is extending this grace to him. It's really interesting because when you read more about Nicodemus, we see him again after the crucifixion, and he is... Uh, helping Joseph of Arimathea yeah, uh, help embalm Jesus and prepare his body for burial. We don't really know, I mean, exactly what happened, but I think he may have been born again. I think he may have put his faith in Jesus. You see, Jesus, for every one of us, was born so we could be born again. In these scriptures, Jesus clearly communicates to us what we must do to have a relationship with him. It's cut and dry. I want to read verse 18 again. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Why? Because they've rejected Jesus. The only thing that's going to separate you from God at judgment will be whether or not you accept Jesus or reject Jesus. It's that simple. It's that simple. And you may be like, well, that, that's just too easy. Well, I don't know why God did it this way. This is just how God did it. And I think it's pretty amazing that God would be so generous toward us that he would extend this offer of life for us. So here's what I want to encourage you to do this Christmas. As you go out of this place and you, you see the, the manger scene and you think about Jesus, I want you to realize that Jesus was born so you could be born again. Jesus was not born to create a holiday. But Jesus was born to create a new way through his son, okay? Every time you think about the birth of Jesus, give thanks to God that you have been born again. 
So I want to ask you that question. Have you? Have you been born again? Just to kind of recap, we've walked through a lot of scripture in a short time. In the Old Testament, it's very clear that people had sinned. It was a vicious cycle. They would get close to God, fall back in their sin. Get close to God, fall back in their sin. There was nothing they could do. Sacrificing animals, offering sacrifices, doing good works. And they could not repair what had been broken with God. But God, in his incredible grace, sent his son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin. And that birth matters so much. We celebrate that at Christmas, and we celebrate the incredible, miraculous gift of God through sending his son to be born of a virgin, to open up access back to him through his son, Jesus. But here's the reality, and Jesus told Nicodemus this, you must put your faith in who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Have you done that? Have you personally done that? You know what's so amazing is it is a free gift of God, not based on how hard you work or your own efforts. Because you know what? Even after following Jesus and putting my faith in him 20 plus years ago, there's still days where I fail. There's days where I fall back like they did in the Old Testament. But the difference is my standing with God is not based on how I perform. My standing with God is based on the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that's the difference. So how do you stand today? Where do you stand? I want to help you follow him. Over the last several weeks, we've had 51 people pray to give their lives to Jesus. Yeah, it's all God, you know. And I believe that God wanted me to preach this message because there's somebody, more than one, who are here today and you saw Miss Eleanor be obedient. You hear this message and you keep feeling God press on you to be obedient. And you just keep delaying. Well, you don't know if you're going to live to be 95 and you don't know what's going to happen. I don't say that to scare you. But I do want to warn you that you don't. But God loves you so much. He loved you so much that he brought you into this place today to receive this gift. And it's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit you need him. Admit you're a sinner. Admit what we've seen in the Bible. <laughs> you know, I agree, yep, that's me. B, believe Jesus is the Son of God. And C, confess him as your personal Lord and Savior. Put your faith and trust in what he's done and who he is, not in yourself. When you do that, there's a supernatural exchange that takes place that we just read about. Whoever believes in him will not stand condemned. But whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Filled with the Spirit of God. A supernatural exchange where you go from being spiritually dead in your sin to alive in Christ. Not based on anything you've done, but based on putting your faith and trust in him. And there's a supernatural transfer that takes place in your life. You are born of the spirit of God.